So let me begin my own formulation inspired by both Darwin and the Dalai Lama. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, he left out that my first few visits to Vancouver were to the west coast of Vancouver Island to kayak. And that's when I first uh, got acquainted with this part of the world. I feel a special debt to Vancouver and to the Dalai Lama Center for really much of what I've been thinking and doing for the last six or seven years. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, Victor left out of the story of my first meeting with the Dalai Lama 10 years ago that I had absolutely, I would say, a minus interest in Buddhism. I viewed it as simply another one of the many cults that plague the Bay Area, and I had avoided all the rest of them, I had no intention of getting involved with this one. But my daughter, when she was 16, spent six weeks in Nepal, and unknowns to her and to us, after four weeks of trekking, she spent the last two weeks living in a Tibetan refugee camp with the Tibetan family. And she came back motivated to try to do something about Tibet. And she formed the largest high school free Tibet club in America, and she organized boycotts, and she got her against the Holiday Inn, which wasn't hiring Tibetans in Tibet. Uh, they changed that policy. She got her mother and I to hand out pamphlets at uh, the showing of Kandura in San Francisco. And I knew that if you got invited to talk to the Dalai Lama at one of his meetings with scientists, you got to bring a silent observer. And I thought, what a treat that would be for my daughter. And so I put my hat into the ring and was invited and brought her and I had introduced her to the Dalai Lama as my spiritual advisor. <laughs> she was the reason I was here. But within a few days, it was clear that we had formed a connection uh, that's been very important in my life, totally unexpected. I view it as the second great adventure of my life. The first was working in a Stone Age culture in New Guinea more than 40 years ago. Now, when I heard that the Dalai Lama was going to be speaking in Vancouver in 2004, uh, I got in touch with one of his uh, gatekeepers. There's more than one. And uh, I was supposed to have a brief meeting with him, but it got pushed aside. But I brought my daughter with me, and we listened to this session on opening the heart. And... Uh, a number of distinguished fig figures, Bishop Tutu, Rabbi Salman Shakhtar, um, Irin Abadi, uh, a justice from Iran who got the Nobel Prize, um, a woman whose name I don't remember, but you probably do, Joanna, what's the last? Joanna Archibald. And each of them, when asked to talk about what had opened their heart, each of them talked about their religion. And then the last to speak was the Dalai Lama. And he got up and he looked at each one of them and chuckled and said, don't you know that it's religions that divide the world? What unites the world is our emotions. We all have the same emotions. Now, I had presented to him, and he had mightily rejected. He's really one of the most skillful debaters. He loves debate. He loves taking every side of any issue to see where it will lead. Um, he debates with passion, without rancor. I said to him in one of our meetings, you know, when I talk with you, I can completely relax because I don't have to worry about being forceful. People usually interpret the force of my speech as a sign of anger. It isn't. It's passion. And he said, what's the use of talking about something if you don't care about it? And he argues with as much passion as I do. And we switch sides continuously. 
see where it'll go, what we'll discover that we didn't know before. The, after that 2004 meeting, I thought quite a lot about how our emotions divide us. They don't just unite us. And over time, I formulated a list of 25 issues that I thought it would be profitable for us to discuss. But I was quite reluctant to try to ask for any of his time. He has so many responsibilities. And I sent it to Jimpa, who, a former monk, who acts as a translator, but is really quite a philosopher, running a classics project in Montreal. And I sent it to Alan Wallace, a Buddhist scholar, um, and to Matthew Ricard, another, uh, a monk actually now. I said, do you think this would be worthwhile? And they all encouraged me and they made some suggestions. And it took a year and a half and we had our first meeting for 12 hours, one on one. And then, I don't know who, that's not my phone. Then a short time later, a year later, we met for another two and a half hours and then six months, no, three months after that, for five hours a day, five days in a row. What a treat. And the book is a result of it, and the book would not have occurred without Vancouver, the Dalai Lama Center, and Victor Chan. So thank you very much. The Darwin quotes I'm going to begin with all come from the only book he wrote about humans, that's focused on humans, Descent of Man, published in 1871. The expression of emotion, which I view as the start of psychology, was published in 1872. It was originally to be a chapter in Descent of Man, but it got too long, so he broke it off into a separate book. Uh, one of his biographers said that Descent of Man is his least known best book. There are two chapters on morality. And in this first quote, Darwin talks about compassion in animals, actually in a human-animal interaction. Now we see whether the technology works. Now, I usually don't read PowerPoints, but how can you resist the opportunity to read Charles Darwin? Several years ago, a keeper at the zoological gardens showed me some deep and scarcely healed wounds on the nape of his own neck, inflicted on him whilst kneeling on the floor by a fierce baboon. The little American monkey, who was a warm friend of his keeper, lived in the same compartment and was dreadfully afraid of the great baboon. Nevertheless, as soon as he saw his friend in peril, he rushed to the rescue and by screams and bites so distracted the baboon that the man was able to escape after running great risk of his life. There could be a great children's book built about the little American monkey and the fierce great baboon. Another quote from Darwin. And this next one is about heroism. Now, I've titled my talk, Compassion and Heroism. I like linking the two because to people to whom compassion worries them a little bit, heroism doesn't. Heroism is one form of compassion, which I'll later describe. But here's Darwin's description of heroism. It is evident in the first place that with mankind, the instinctive impulses have different degrees of strength. A savage will risk his own life to save that of a member of the same community, but will be wholly indifferent about a stranger. A young and timid mother, urged by the maternal instinct, will, without a moment's hesitation, run the greatest danger for her own infant, but not of a mere fellow creature. Nevertheless, many a civilized man who never before risked his life for another, but full of courage and sympathy, has disregarded the instinct of self-preservation and plunged at once into a torrent to save a drowning man, 
though a stranger. In this case, man is impelled by the same instinctive motive which made the heroic little American monkey formerly described save his keeper by attacking the great and dreadful baboon. Now, Darwin has pointed out a number of things. One, he's pointed out the importance of the mother-infant relationship, which we'll come back to in terms of its role in compassion. He's pointed also to the fact that sometimes some people will act without regard for their own safety to save another human being. We'll come back to that when, we dis when I discuss heroism. So let me begin my own formulation inspired by both Darwin and the Dalai Lama. The terms empathy and sympathy are used by different writers to mean overlapping and sometimes different things. So I would like to distinguish, to begin with, two very different things. Emotion recognition and emotional resonance. Now, emotion recognition simply means that you know how another person is feeling. If you don't, you cannot act compassionately. If you don't recognize when they're suffering, when they're in anguish, in pain, you won't know what to do or when to do it. So it is a prerequisite. It is the first prerequisite for compassion. Fortunately, it's enabled. You don't have to teach it. It's present in all but disabled populations, special populations. Virtually everyone in the world is capable of recognizing the emotions that others feel. So this, now, recognizing that you're suffering doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to help you. In fact, a good torturer has to have good emotion recognition so that they can adjust just how much pain you can bear. But without emotion recognition, if we were totally blind to the feelings of others, there would be no possibility for compassion. Now, we've recently developed a tool that's on the internet that teaches people how to recognize even concealed emotions. They become visible. Uh, it actually takes about an hour, and you can tell how people are feeling even when they don't want you to know. Well, this has been featured a lot in the TV program, Lie to Me. Now let me return to emotional resonance. By this I mean that you feel in yourself, in your body, you experience the same feelings of the person that you're observing, physiologically. So if you feel fear, I feel your fear. If you feel anger, I feel your anger. If you feel pain, I feel your pain. I'll refer to this later as identical resonance. That is, I feel exactly the same emotion you feel. There's a second kind of resonance, reactive. I see your anger. I feel concerned that you're so angry. What can I do to help you deal with your anger? I'm not feeling your anger. I'm feeling an emotion about your anger. If I see you suffering, I feel concern. It saddens me. I worry, which is a form of fear, that you're suffering. What can I do to help it? Two types of resonance. This is the second prerequisite. If you don't resonate, it's not too likely you're going to respond with compassion. Now here's one of the many dilemmas to which we do not yet know the answer, but it, we could find out. Some people resonate to the suffering of others, and others do not. In fact, as my own mentor many years ago, he published this in 1962. 
I don't think anyone other than me has read it in the last 30 years or 40 years. Many people respond to the suffering of others with disgust or anger. Why can't you take care of yourself? Why do you think it's my burden to relieve your suffering? And others respond with indifference. You're suffering? Well, that's not my problem. I mean, just get out of my way. What's responsible? How can we explain why some people have resonance and others don't? This is just a, one of many questions that form a research agenda that I hope we will see in the next decade people address. Because without the answers to these, we will not be able to make it the more compassionate world that's required if we're going to leave a planet that's anything like it looks and is now to our children and grandchildren. So let me return. Keep in mind, emotion recognition, that's there. You don't have to worry about it. Everyone's got it. Emotional resonance, only some people, and we don't know why, only some people resonate, particularly to the suffering of others. Darwin again. He's now talking about the origin of compassion. We are impelled to relieve the suffering of another in order that our own painful feelings may be at the same time relieved. The mere sight of suffering, independently of love, would suffice to call up in us vivid recollections and associations. What he is saying is, I act to relieve your suffering in order to relieve the suffering I'm experiencing because I'm resonating to your suffering. In some sense, I'm acting selfishly. If I help you, I won't suffer so much. If you don't suffer so much, I don't. Now that sounds very much like the Buddhist idea of interdependence, doesn't it? I verified by going back to Darwin's notebooks in 1838, he wrote these ideas before he had any knowledge of Buddhism. He didn't learn about Buddhism until the 1850s. And he didn't learn a great deal, but he learned some. Now, this is a rather bad photograph, but note your own reaction to it. If you look at that woman's suffering, it should, in many of you, stir resonance. Even though it's a photograph and a grainy one at that. This is a photograph taken of a woman who had just learned that her missing 13-year-old son's body had been found, tortured, raped, and murdered. It's an occasion for reactive resonance. Now see what the Dalai Lama says, really almost identical to Darwin, and he did not know Darwin at all. In the human mind, seeing someone bleeding and dying makes you uncomfortable. That is the seed of compassion. We are thus impelled to relieve the sufferings of another in order that our own painful feelings may be at the same time relieved. He's a Darwinian. Darwin is a Buddhist. Neither knew about the other. It's independently coming to the same conclusion. Dalai Lama again, compassion is focused on the suffering of the other, on the wish to see others free from suffering. In the human mind, seeing bleeding and dying makes you uncomfortable. That is the seed of compassion. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't make everyone uncomfortable. Some people are indifferent. Some people are angered by it. Some people are disgusted by it. Years ago, when I was doing cross-cultural research in both Northern California and Tokyo, I showed films of people undergoing painful surgery to students at Waseda University and at Berkeley, California. This was 1967. 
And in both cultures, about a third responded with resonance when they saw the suffering, I could see on their face suffering. About a third responded with disgust. They were repulsed by the sight of suffering in both cultures. And about a third showed both reactions. So once again, why? Why the different reactions? What's responsible for it? Where does it come from? We know it comes in those who show it without special preparation or training. It's there. How did it get there? How can we get it in more people? Well, you can see I got ahead of my game. These are the two types of resonance. I've already explained this, but uh, you can see it. Now, my friend Alan Wallace, one of the great pleasures of having gotten to know the Dalai Lama is I've gotten to know some of the people around him. Alan, if you haven't encountered him, He's an extraordinary Buddhist scholar. He was trained by the Dalai Lama. He was a monk for eight years in Tibet and now runs the Santa Barbara Institute and teaches and writes. And if you've ever met Alan, one of the amazing things is that he speaks perfect prose. You could take every word he says and just put it on the page and publish it. No editing required. I've met very few people like that. You spoke of envy. I have Alan Wallace envy. I would love, I go through seven or eight drafts before it gets to the publisher. So Alan, can you read this at the back of the room? Yes? So I don't need to read it for you. You can see, although Victor, I'll read it for Victor. You can see it here? Okay. Because Alan is really challenging Darwin, but he's challenging the Dalai Lama also, in that um, then neither one of them dealt with the fact that it doesn't happen in all people. Probably it's a minority that it happens in. In my research in 1967, it was only a third in both Japan and the US. So you can have these other reactions. Darwin, by the end of his life, was also skeptical. In the last two years of his life, he, had, he wrote his autobiography, a charming book. He wrote it at the requests of his children. And he said, I doubt indeed whether humanity is a natural or innate quality. Well, that's going too far in the other direction. It is a natural and innate quality in some people but not all. Do we all have the capacity? Now, I believe there is an exception. And that is familial compassion. We don't think it extraordinary that the mother or father or whoever the caretaker is responds to comfort the infant. Immediately, without thought. We don't say, why did you do that? In fact, there used to be a time, I remember, my daughter was a world-class crier. I mean, as long, she averaged a little less than two hours a night of sleep in the first two years. She was just too interested in what was going on around her. And as long as you were talking to her or swinging her, she didn't cry. And the moment you stopped the stimulation, the crying began. A key to her personality is her first word, more. <laughs> Both Darwin, in the quote I read you earlier, and the Buddhists believe that the relationship between the mother and offspring is the nub. It's the given that's there 
The species would not survive if it wasn't there. We have the longest period of infantile dependency, human beings. It's got to be built in. It's exceptional. It gets into the newspapers when a parent doesn't act to relieve the suffering. Not when they do act. That's the norm. The other is the abnormal exception. So is familial compassion an emotion? Like anger and fear and sadness and disgust? As a student of emotion, this has been quite some concern to me. This is my most academic PowerPoint. There are certain things about it that are the same as we find in emotion. It's universal to the species, as are emotions. It's unbidden. You don't have to think, oh, what should I do? My infant is crying. It's bleeding. Oh, should I do something about that? No, it's totally unbidden. It's involuntary. The appraisal that calls forth the compassionate action is immediate. It's fast. You don't have to consciously think about it. You do it. And it's influenced, when I say ontogeny and phylogeny, it's influenced both by the history of the species on this planet and by your own developmental history in all likelihood. But we don't yet know whether the physiology is distinctive. We don't yet know whether there are distinctive sensations, and we don't yet know whether familial compassion owns its own signal. Anger, fear, sadness, disgust, surprise, enjoyment, and contempt own their own unique signal. A former student of mine, Dacher Keltner, thinks that compassion does, but I'm not as convinced as he does. The other thing it shares with other emotions is it's not unique, as the first quote showed. In fact, in my theoretical writings, I've said, if you only find it in humans, it's not an emotion. Emotions are things we share at least with other primates. And compassion is something that is shared with other primates. So it meets many of the criteria, but not all. So now, there's one other unique feature a familial compassion, and that is a restricted target. Now, you can be angry at anything or anyone. It doesn't have to be a family member to get you angry. It doesn't have to be your lover or your child or your co-worker or your friend. You can get angry when you read the newspaper about what a total stranger has done. You can get angry when there's a traffic jam. You can get angry when you come out and see a flat tire. A whole variety of things can be the occasion for each of the emotions. They don't have a restricted target. Familial compassion has a restricted target. It's a family member. Now, you probably by now are getting the sense that I like questions. It's really what's intriguing is what we don't yet know and what questions we can formulate. So... Do we have the same immediate connection to act compassionately towards our 12-year-old that we have towards our 12-day-old? Does it attenuate with the age of the offspring? Does it attenuate with the distance? Do we feel the same towards our siblings, towards our uncles and aunts, our grandparents? Our cousins, our second cousins? Or is it really restricted to the helpless infant? Again, a question we don't know the answer to. Let me move now. We have familial compassion. Remember, I went over two prerequisites, emotion recognition and resonance. And now I've identified what the Buddhists and Darwin believe is the seed of compassion, familial compassion, a semi-emotion, different in some ways, similar in others. Am I out of order? Oh, what we're not seeing is the very top. 
The top of this is global or stranger compassion. When you heard about the tsunami or read about what happened in Haiti, some people, without anyone asking them, acted to try to relieve the suffering, send money. Some people went there. Okay. This is stranger compassion. You don't know those people. They don't have the same skin color, same religion, the same background. Now I'm proposing that this global or stranger compassion is not binary. It's not absent or present. It's a matter of degree. Some people, without any special training that we know of, have it towards everyone. Some people have it towards some, but not all. So it varies in the scope, and it varies in the centrality of life. For some people, this concern, this stranger compassion, directs their entire life. Doctors Without Borders would be an example, but there are a number of other examples. Um, many of the people who work in emergency rooms, who choose to do so, dealing with an enormous amount of suffering. The, we see it has become the central feature of their life. While for others who act quite honorably and quite compassionately, it's a sidelight. It's not the organizing principle of their life. What's the difference between these people? Why one, not the other? How do we explain it? Isn't it amazing that we don't know the answer to these questions? I return to Darwin. Sentient compassion is a lovely quote. Sympathy beyond the confines of man, that is, humanity to lower animals, seems to be one of the latest moral acquisitions. This virtue, concern for lower animals, is one of the noblest with which man is endowed and seems to arise incidentally from our sympathies becoming more tender and more widely diffused until they extend to all sentient beings. When I read this quote to the Dalai Lama in 2006, Jimpa said, did he use that phrase, sentient beings? Yes, indeed he did. And the Dalai Lama said, I am a Darwinian. So to feel compassion not just for strangers, but for anything that's living, that's another form of compassion. Some people have it. Where did it come from? And now the last form of compassion we've dealt with. Familial, stranger, sentient. Now let's go back to heroic compassion. And I, these come from the earlier quotes from Darwin. And we all know and we read, heroic compassion is sufficiently rare that when it occurs, it gets in the newspapers. The fellow who jumped into the subway tracks to pull a person to safety. The people who jump into a frozen pond to pull a child out, sometimes losing their own life. Most of us don't know whether we have heroic compassion because we haven't been in this situation. We weren't standing on the subway platform and did nothing. We haven't been tested. It's one of the hardest things to research because of that. So what defines heroic compassion? There has to be a risk to your own life. It can be global or only to familiars. The heroism that we see in the military is generally directed just at the members of your own squad, people you're very familiar with. It is heroic. They are putting their own life at risk to reduce the suffering of others, but it's constrained. It can be for all sentient beings. 
You can care as much about a dog or a horse as you do about a human. And it can be either impulsive or extended. The woman who's done the most work on this is called Kristen Monroe. The book is titled Altruism. And Monroe examined philanthropists who never put their own welfare at risk, but they do good things. They give money to good causes. Where would the world be if we didn't have any philanthropists? What distinguishes philanthropists from other wealthy people who don't do that? Monroe asked. And then she looked at what I've called the impulsive. These are the people who never thought they were going to do this, but when they, the situation arose, they acted, like the person in the, jumping into the subway. Her sample of extended were Europeans who rescued Jews from the Nazis. They put not just their life, but often their families or their village. And it wasn't just for a moment. It was extended over time. Now, Monroe is a political scientist, and so she asked no psychological questions, but she asked all the demographics. And she said, what distinguishes these people from the philanthropists? Well, it has nothing to do with how old they are, with their sex, with their nationality, with whether they're religiously observant, and if so, what religion? All of those are irrelevant. The only thing and I haven't yet found out whether Monroe is a Buddhist, is what she called worldview, which of course is a phrase that Buddhists use. But when you read the interviews, they're stunning. She says to them, well, why did you do this? And they said, I had to. How'd you make up your mind? I didn't make up my mind. I had to do it. They're human beings. No choice. Impelled. Required. Why that worldview in some, but not in most? Remember, again, I'm not talking about people who've been going to meditation retreats. These people had no special training. Nothing that can be discovered so far. It's crucial to find out about these people. What has led them in this direction? Let me now quickly run through. Taking longer than I thought. Why global ascension and heroic compassion are not emotions. Emotions can be enacted constructively or destructively, not these forms of compassion. They're only constructive. All human beings have emotions. Not all human beings have these forms of compassion, only the familial. You don't need to cultivate your emotions. You may need to learn how to manage them. But for most of us, we need to cultivate compassion if it isn't there. And it isn't there, except in the familial setting, for most of us. Emotions distort our perceptions of the world around us, at least temporarily. And according to practitioners such as the Dalai Lama, your perception is more vivid in compassion. Uh, emotions typically occur without any initial awareness. You don't realize that you've become emotional unless you've become highly skilled. But people who act compassionately realize what they're doing. Emotions can be out of control and you can do things you regret later. Compassion isn't out of control. And emotions are momentary and this is not a momentary state. So how can we explain the relationships among these? If you have stranger compassion or global, will you have sentient? If you have sentient, will you have stranger? Actually, I know a lot of people, not an enormous number, but I have friends who would do anything for a cat. Many of those things they would never do for another human being. They care more about, and they're very compassionate towards cats. Some people towards horses, some people towards dogs. It seems rather specialized. 
There are people. Are the people in Doctors Without Borders? I don't know the answer to this. It's a question. Do they have sentient compassion? Do they feel that same way towards any living being, or is it just towards human beings? We don't know the answer to this or any of the other questions. So how do we explain? This is the $64 question. I'm giving away my age, but Victor already did. Although he didn't say how old the Dalai Lama was, he did say I'm a year older than he is. The $64 question, that, when I was a youth, that was the question. I mean, that was a lot of money, $64. And everybody listened to that program once a week to see who was going to win it. And it went from $2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32 to the $64 question. And this is the $64 question. Why do these things occur without training in some people? And I'm going to, in my last remarks, offer some explanations. One is, maybe it's just chance. Inexplicable. There are a lot of things that happen by chance. We don't like to think of it that way. We like to think of the world as predictable and orderly. Many writers have said it's upbringing. I remember being at a meeting where the Dalai Lama was asked, how can I bring up my child so they'll be compassionate? And he said, why ask me? I don't have children. Does, it, does a strong attachment between parent and infant mean that we are going to find that person is going to have stranger compassion? We could find out the answer, but we don't know at this point in time. Is it genetic? I said to the Dalai Lama in one of our meetings, since I have no worries about him disagreeing. In fact, if he disagrees, that's much more fun than if he agrees. I said, you know, karma is really a fantastic metaphor for the past influencing the present. And we now know what the mechanism is. It's our genes. He rejected that totally. It's just another bit of my Western materialism. Is it a previous incarnation? That's the traditional Buddhist explanation. You work your way towards this. And those who show compassion and have it without training, it's because of their life in previous incarnations. Well, we'd have no evidence for choosing among these explanations. All but the reincarnation ones are researchable. Here's my last Darwin quote. In however complex a manner this feeling may have originated, as it is one of high importance, this is compassion, to all those animals which aid and defend one another. Incidentally, what he's suggesting here is you take solitary animals who do not depend on each other and live in groups, it's going to be totally absent. They'll never show compassion. It's a good bet. Franz de Waals thinks that holds very well. It will have been increased through natural selection. Aha, we bring natural selection in. That is, those societies in which compassion becomes the norm, will flourish because we need the cooperation of others. For those communities which included the greatest number of the most sympathetic members would flourish best and rear the greatest number of offspring. What an optimistic view. Unfortunately, it isn't true. Again, Alan Wallace. Wouldn't this suggest that individuals and communities that include the greatest number of the most sympathetic members should be the most populous today? I don't think the facts support this. Among all Buddhist cultures, that of Tibet most strongly emphasized the importance of compassion for all sentient beings. And for the roughly 800 years that this ideal dominated this society, Tibet displayed relatively little aggression towards its neighbors and inflicted very little harm on its own indigenous wildlife, but that made them all the more vulnerable when they were invaded and occupied and suffered genocide. Alan is suggesting something that neither he nor I nor Matthew nor the Dalai Lama can go and find out about, but he is suggesting that compassion 
is the norm. Compassion towards strangers would be the norm in Tibetan society. As a result of 800 years of encouragement of this and training of this. If that's the case, indeed, if it is the case, that would be very important to document. But it hasn't been documented, and at least at this point, those of us who are associated with the Dalai Lama are not allowed in Tibet. I was just uh, refused a visa. Matthew Ricard has just had his visa turned down for the first time. So what can we do to cultivate these forms of compassion? Well, one idea is compassion gymnasiums. There are places you can go to exercise your muscles, but there may well be, may well be possible to construct gymnasiums where you could develop and cultivate your compassion. And I have some ideas uh, about how you could do that. Experiences that involve shared connections to strangers, the work projects, internet chat groups perhaps, school exchanges, that may also, we don't know, but it's a promising lead that should be explored. And of course, research on what's responsible for those who have it without training could provide us with insights about how to inculcate it in the majority, not the minority. Thank you for your attention. I welcome questions.